to say for the second service, we have 10.30 service this morning. And then this evening we have 5 o'clock uh, family night supper. And after that, um, we have a question and answer with Cody in here at 6.30. So make sure you come.
things are often completely the opposite of that. That if I were to try to come up here and paint myself to you as this absolutely perfect person, I would be selling you a lie. And I would be selling you something that's not helpful to you at all. For what we find is, if I were to come up here and just list you all my positive qualities, you would only know, well, much less than half of the story. So if I am going to be up here today, I must come here. If boasting is necessary, I will boast in my weaknesses. So I'd like to share my testimony, a large part of my testimony with you this morning. For, for that's what's going to be, what's going to help you know who I am. And it's also going to show you what the glory of God is that is shown through my life and through the lives of every single believer. Uh, because when I grew up, I grew up in the church and I was your, your classical straight-A church kid. So to speak, every single time the doors were open, I was in church. If there was a church camp over the summer, I was there. If there was a talent event or something like that, I was there. I was there at every single thing I could do. I ate up being part of the church. I absolutely loved it. I grew up in the church, and uh, I can remember singing from about the age of three or four up on stage. I can remember uh, listening to sermons, and I can remember my mom would always laugh about this, but I would, uh, I would be in the back and sort of in my own little world, my mom would say, I'd be playing with this or that as a little kid, and then there were, there were a couple times the pastor would ask a question, and even though it didn't look like I was following right along, I would put back with an answer, just out of our from the back of the church, you know, that, that, was, that was my life. The church was a big part of my life growing up, but... Then, as I went throughout school, I was a teenager like most teenagers were. I still went to church. I was still all excited about that stuff. But I was also really excited about a lot of other things. I was really excited about, you know, meeting girls or playing sports or some school-related things and all of that. And what I did not realize throughout all of that time was that all of my church service wasn't enough. I thought that I was a righteous person, that yes, I needed the blood of Jesus, but for the most part, I could stand on my own. And I love how worship always seems to set the stage so well for, for a message. You know, I, I've joked about this with people in the past. It's not, it's not something that the worship team and the, the pastor or the preacher really coordinate and say, okay, now I'm going to be preaching on this, so you got to make sure the music matches this. Usually, you know, the one who truly coordinates the service, the Lord, he's the one who coordinates this. Because if you listen to our songs this morning, many, one, many of them were about thinking that, you know, hey, if you think you can just work hard and get enough, or you just have to do a little bit more or something like that, it's not like that. Because I was an example of I was doing all of the things that you were supposed to be doing, and yet I was still as vile and wicked and sinful as anyone else in the world. But yet, even worse, I had a high and mighty attitude because I thought my church attendance, my church service, and all of that somehow made me better than other people. And so I went from being raised in the church off to a Christian college, a, a, a university where, you know, much of the same thing was the case. I was involved in a lot of things, but all of a sudden, all of the things that I took pride in started to crumble away beneath me. I was... Uh, for the small town I was from, I was a pretty good basketball player. Uh, in college, I was not a good basketball player. I was, there were, there were 15 players on scholarship at college, and I was not one of them. But the coach told me, hey, you know, you have a good GPA, so I will keep you on the roster just for your GPA. Well, that's not what, you know, someone who wants to play basketball wants to hear. Uh, and looking back, there was another guy who was a walk-on, and he ended up mostly taking the games and all that stuff. And I quit basketball, and I thought through high school, I'm never going to quit this game, and I would never quit. Because we're talking, you're not supposed to quit, right? You stick something out. But yet I quit. So part of my pride started to, you know, crumble down there. I was a straight-A student in school. So I told you I'm going to get to my weaknesses, I promise. This is a long story. I will get to my weaknesses. Okay? I was a straight-A student in school, but then I took a little class called calculus, which if you've ever taken calculus, is very challenging. Uh, and so those grades started to slip a little bit too. And I didn't realize how spoiled I was because at home I had mommy and daddy telling me, hey, you need to go to bed at this time and that time, and you know, you need to do what you're supposed to do there. And in college I didn't have that. And so I was staying up till three or four in the morning or six or seven in the morning, playing video games, and then sleeping during class. And by the end of my freshman year of college, I was a complete, complete mess. And some of you 
you might have heard this before because I always like to, anytime I preach, I want people to get at least a picture of who I am because, I mean, why would you want to listen to what I have to say if, you, if I'm just this random stranger up here on stage? So some of you might have heard a little bit of this before, uh, but I was to the point that I remember telling someone flat out that I felt like I was dead inside. But see, I had all this church service, I had all this church upbringing, and I had thought I was a righteous person. But yet, all of a sudden, I felt completely dead inside. And for the New Testament class, once again, I went to a Christian university. Our New Testament final was to read and memorize all of 1 Corinthians 13, and so I did that. And I have it up here for us, if you'd like to read along with me. Uh, just the first set of verses says this. If I speak human or angelic languages, but do not have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Basically, I make a lot of noise, but... Not really any good for anybody. If I have the gift of prophecy and can understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Because love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it is not boastful, it is not conceited, does not act improperly, it is not selfish, it is not provoked. And it does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This is where I was. Uh, in this college class, I could memorize that text because just like everything else, you know, at school, you just, you read and you study and you learn, and then I could do that. I memorized all of that and the rest of the chapter as well, and yet it meant absolutely nothing to me at that point. None of it sunk in. It did not click. I was so caught up in myself and what I was doing and what I wanted to accomplish and watching all of that crumble around that all I could think of was just how, you know, sad my life was all of a sudden. I was a spoiled child who was lost and dying and dead in sins, but I was throwing myself a pity party. And this verse, the very word of God, had no impact on me at all. So flash forward to the summer of that same year, and uh, God had been in the process of breaking me down. And if you've ever been broken down by God before, which I hope you have, it's a very painful process, but a very beautiful one. He was showing me all of these things that I thought that I was, where I thought I was something, I was nothing. I was nothing. And so as I was at home, uh, my parents were on vacation at the time. They were up in Alaska visiting my sister. And I had moved my mattress from my room into the living room because, I don't know, I guess when you're, you know, 19 years old and you have a house to yourself, you just do goofy things. So I had the mattress in, in the living room, and I put it in there, and I was on the mattress reading that very same passage that, that I just read there, that I had been required to memorize uh, for class just the previous semester. And God brought me to my breaking point. Because when we got to the phrases, love is patient, the Holy Spirit said to me, Cody, are you patient? And I can't, I mean, you can try to lie to God all you want, but it doesn't work too well. I said, no, God. So love is kind. Cody, are you kind? And I had to answer, no, God. Love does not envy. Cody, do you envy other people? Absolutely, God, I do. Love is not boastful. Cody, anytime you do anything well at all, do you, do you really like to let people hear about it? Yes, I do, God. Okay? Uh, it is not conceited. It, it does not act improperly. It's not selfish. Cody, are you selfish? It's not provoked. It does not keep a record of wrongs. Hey, do you remember who did this wrong to you back then? And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, honestly, through all the church effort, for the first time in my life, I saw just how sinful I was. Because unlike others who, you know, had maybe been brought up in ignorance or in a broken home or that, I had every single gift imaginable. I had every single, you know, my, my family was wonderful. I had been to church every single chance I could get. I read my Bible. I prayed. I did all of the things that you're supposed to do as a church kid. But for the very first time in my life, I saw my actual estate. And I was helpless. Because I thought 
are you ready to start doing things my way? And said, yes, let's start doing things your way. And that was roughly 10 years ago. And since then, things have not been perfect. That's usually the part of my testimony that I've shared. So if you've heard that part before, when I preached the last time, that's where I usually end it. Because I can tell you, God often gives you understanding of what you went through after the fact and not before. So let me testify to you about the past 10 years, because everything in my life, it would seem, has been leading up to this point, this exact very moment. I can tell you this past week, I've spent more time in tears than probably most of the rest of the weeks of the year combined. And that's saying something, because, and I mentioned this the last time I ministered, I probably cried more in the past year than in previous years combined. So let me talk to you about this, because I was saved... And I was changed, but not all the change happened at once. And if you're walking on that road with me this morning, say amen. Because God immediately saved my soul. He transformed me so that I was no longer in the kingdom of darkness, but I was translated into the kingdom of light. My soul was saved for eternity, but my actions were often still unrighteous. Because I was still a 19-year-old kid, and I didn't immediately become very responsible. I was quite, quite irresponsible. But I went back to college in the fall, and it was a private university, so it was quite expensive, just to let you know on that. And I thought, hey, now that I'm saved, all of a sudden, everything's going to work out. It's all just going to be great. And in one instance, that was correct, but it still wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought things were just going to work out, and life was going to be easy now. I think that when they got saved, life was all of a sudden going to be easy. Life has been much harder since salvation, but so much better. Because I went back to college and I thought, hey, you know, like I said, things are going to be easy, and they weren't. There was a, a longing that began to develop in my heart, and it wasn't but a few months after that that I began to really sense a call to ministry. And I remember laying in bed uh, in my dorm with my roommate Sam. And uh, we, we had bunk beds back then. And we were talking, and it got to be really late at night because I was still irresponsible. It was about 2 or 3 in the morning. And I was talking to him, and this, he was the first person I really told about this. And I said, Sam, I think God's calling me into ministry. And uh, he had asked me, and I had sort of asked myself, you know, what can I, I asked God, well, what kind of ministry do you want me to be in, right? Because with my church upbringing, you know, you got your youth ministry, you got your worship ministry. You got your evangelists, you got your pastors, you got this, that, your missionaries, this, that, and the other thing. I was like, well, what do you want me to do? And God never gave me an answer on that because I wasn't ready to do it yet. Whatever it was, I just wasn't there. But basically, the only answer you would give me is you're going to do whatever I ask you to do. Well, that's simple enough, but that's, that's a scary answer to get, right? So I continued on, and I began to seek out that call, but I sought it out in my own way at first. I knew I couldn't continue on at the college I was going to because it was too expensive. So I began to look at the semester at another college to transfer to. And uh, as I was looking at it, I thought things were going to work out. I had it all prepared and then was going to transfer over Christmas break and was sitting at home. And, you know, my dad, who's much smarter than me when it comes to a lot of uh, financial things, was like, Cody, I don't, I don't think this is the time. I don't think this is going to work out for you. You probably should just come back home and uh, finish up at community college. And one of the things I had said in high school is I was never going to go to community college because, you know, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't the prideful thing to do. But let me tell you, if you went to community college, you made a wonderful decision. I went back to community college, and I thought I, thought I was, you know, moving back home was, oh, no, I must have failed if I went away and then I came back. But moving back to community college was the best decision for me. I, I saved a lot of debt that I would have continued to go in. And also, God kept humbling me. But I kept seeking out how to fulfill this call that God had given me. And I started going to about five different churches on a weekly basis. I was eating it up. I, I loved, I still love going to church, but now all of a sudden, things were making sense. And so I went there, and uh, I didn't have a job, so I was mooching off my parents for gas money. As I said, I'm going to boast of my weaknesses. Let me go back to that slide. Okay? I have to remind myself. I was mooching off my parents for gas money at this point, and all of a sudden, I was running out of gas. And so I couldn't go to church anymore with, at all these different churches. 
Okay, which I was thinking, hey, you know, God will just make my car keep going because he wants me in church, right? But God planned a lot. I had to start going to church with my parents. It's one of the other things I thought, oh, I'm not going to go back to my family's church. That's not going to happen, you know? But I went back there, and it wasn't long, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit moved on me, and I knew the youth leaders very well because they were my youth leaders growing up, and they weren't really doing much at the time because they didn't have room in their schedule, and there were only a few teenagers there, and I said, you should have a youth service tonight. They're like, okay. And I was like, and, and if you'd like, I'll, I'll minister it. They said, okay, awesome. And so we had a youth service, and uh, it, it, went, it went fine. It went, you know, about as well as you probably think the first time someone ministered would go. Uh, but then the next week in the church bulletin, I all of a sudden saw that they had me at down as their youth leader. And I was like, well, I don't really know where that came from, but okay, glory to God. And I continued to serve there for about a year, but like I said, I was still a kid in a lot of ways. I was still pretty irresponsible. And then I knew I needed to go back to college after I finished my associates and get my bachelor's. And so uh, a year to a year and a half later, I moved up to Kirksville thinking that, hey, I'll go back to just sort of blending in in the background in the church and just sort of try to learn more and try to learn a lot of the stuff that I was missing because I didn't understand this word of God very well yet. Um, and so I went up to the church in Kirksville thinking, oh, I'll, I'll blend in the background. And unbeknownst to me, the, the youth pastor of that church left the very Sunday that I came into that church. Uh, and it was a big rough ordeal. There was a church split and everything. And the youth pastor went and started another church in that town. And I went and introduced myself to the pastor. And I told him a little bit about who I was and what I had done in the past. But I wasn't thinking much of it. He got really excited. And, uh, you know, uh, personality-wise, he, he was kind of similar to uh, Pastor Don. Because I got to meet Pastor Don and talk to him some. And uh, no joke, first Sunday I'm ever in this church, never met these people in my life. And he's like, he starts the service and says, now we got someone new with us today. Come up and introduce yourself. I'm like, I really hope he doesn't do this to everybody. But he made me come up and introduce myself to this entire church and talk about myself. And that was terrifying because, I mean, I'm just, this is my first Sunday at this church. So anyways, continuing on, I'm trying to, I don't want to keep you too late, so I'm trying to go through a little bit slow and quickly. Um, yeah. A couple months later, you know, I was happy just going and attending and all of that. He calls me on the phone and says, hey, come to the office. I have something I want to talk to you about. And uh, it was at that moment that God really hit me again. I started to cry as I, because I knew what he was going to talk to me about. And I drove over there. And he said, we'd like you to come be the youth leader. He said, we had been praying since we knew that the youth pastor would be leaving, that God would send us another one. And you walked in the door, literally the the day that he was gone, and I was just taken back by it. I was so excited, and and that made me excited too. And so I really began to uh, cut my teeth, so to speak, in ministry at that church. Because it's one thing to serve in your church that you've been raised at, but it's another to go to another place where, you know, if you're in your home church, you know, people are generally nicer to you. And, and easier to accept it, you know, it's like, even if you do something wrong, you're like, oh, well, you know, I still remember when he was three years old, we'll just be patient with it. But if you're out in another church, you know, there are going to be some higher standards at times, and that's good. That's what I needed. But even in that, I was still irresponsible. Because I can tell you, I love working in ministry, but I was also a full-time college student. And so in my second semester at Truman, up in Kirksville, I failed every single one of my classes other than choir. <laughs> Literally, one of those classes was voice lessons. And I failed voice lessons because I did not schedule an accompanist to come and play with me for my recital. So I just didn't do my recital. So even though I was a believer, I was still highly flawed and highly weak. I was not ready in large portion for what God was wanting me ultimately to do. There were times I was so irresponsible. There were times that I would show up to youth service late, and I was the youth leader. And I, I can say that looking back now and, and laughing, and don't worry, they didn't give me a bad reference because, you know, I, I didn't put my pastor there as a reference. So you can, you can follow up on that if you need to. But I was very irresponsible. 
responsible. Wow. After I was saved. And God had to work that out of me. So I stopped going to college all the time because I knew I wasn't working hard enough and I was wasting money. And I told my pastor, I know that what I need to learn is how to work hard. Because many of my generation, and, and you don't have to say amen out loud to this, <laughs> aren't great at working hard yet. We grew up with many blessings, but sometimes too much of a blessing can turn into a curse. We had a, I had everything handed to me, and so I didn't have to work hard for anything. And so God had to teach me how to work hard. But he began to do that, and over the course of the next year, the youth group really started to grow. And I, I could say grow in number, but really it started to grow in fellowship and in maturity. And that's what's far more important, because God can take three people and, and do mighty things, or he can take a thousand people and do mighty things. The numbers aren't a really big deal. But people who will truly serve God and grow in that, that's a big deal. And so it started to grow and grow and grow. But then I had realized that I had reached the end of my current ability. That I, uh, I had reached the end of my road after a couple of years of ministry there. And I wanted to step out of the way so that another could come along and take what had been built and build on top. And so I took another youth pastor, once again, back in my hometown, because I knew that I also still needed to go back and finish college, and knew that I could not just keep going into debt and student loans to do that. And so I moved back home and lived with my parents, which, if you've ever lived with your parents in your 20s or after, it can be a challenging thing, and a humbling thing. My parents were wonderful. They were amazing. It's nothing of their fault. But you know it's a humbling thing to go back there and to live in your room that you were raised in, as opposed to, I had a four-bedroom house in Kirksville that I was able to stay at. Uh, it was a humbling thing to move back home. And I worked in ministry there and wasn't seeing the same fruit, and that puzzled me. Because I was doing everything about the same as I was doing in Kirksville, but it just wasn't producing the same results. And so after about a year of that, I decided I would step away and just volunteer and once again let maybe someone else come along who could produce the fruit of what we can produce. And so I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I got a call out of the blue that there was a job at the alternative school at the local school district opening up. Which I thought, oh no, that's scary. But I accepted it. And it was beautiful because God began to show me something new. He began to show me the community at large. I lived a very sheltered life. I never saw all of the problems that can happen in a small community. I didn't realize that my community had a drug problem. We had, you know, which I know this is common across a lot of Missouri, we had a lot of problems with methamphetamines and other opiates and heroin and, and all of that kind of stuff. But I had never seen it in my walk of life. But all of a sudden I was around it every day. I had a student come to school once on something and she looked like a zombie. And she passed out and we had to call 911 in the middle of a school day to come and, you know, revive this girl, basically. Uh, and that will start to really break your heart. Because ministry had been something of convenience before that. But then I started to develop a great burden for these kids. Along this course of time, which I'm already almost over on time and I've got a lot to go, so I'm going to try to talk quickly. Uh, over the course of time, I also got an opportunity to coach because I was very into basketball. And I got an opportunity to coach at a local Lutheran school, uh, which was a very small school. And when I was thinking coach, I was thinking like the kids that I had played basketball with growing up who had played AAU ball and all of that stuff. But a lot of these kids didn't really play a lot of basketball before, before I got older. And so our first year, we didn't really win a lot of games. And our set, my second year, we didn't really win a lot of games. But I enjoyed it, and I really got to know some of the kids, and uh, it's been cool to see them grow up. But I continued on at the alternative school and uh, loved it. And then I got a call out of the blue from the Lutheran school that I had coached at asking me if I would come teach math there. And I said, well, I, I thank you for considering me, but I don't have my math certification, so that's going to be kind of hard. And they said, we don't care. We want you anyway. <laughs> it was in the middle of the year, so it was as a substitute, so they can legally do that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, so I go there and I interview, and I, I didn't think too much of it, but I got the job, and I began to teach math, and uh, that's, that's a challenging thing, if you, if you can 
never had to teach math. I know you all have to go through math, but imagine trying to teach math people who hate math. You, know, you think the math is challenging itself, which it is. Uh, but I went throughout that and uh, still had this desire to be in ministry, but God was still preparing me in many ways. You know, I wasn't criticized much in either church I've been at, but I can tell you as a teacher, teachers face a lot of criticism at times, mostly from the students, uh, every now and then from the parents, but mostly from the students. And so through that, God continued to humble me and give me a burden for, for children, but really just for lost people in general. But also, he just continued to equip me and teach me how to work hard. Because, you know, if anyone's ever taught in a public school classroom or a private school classroom or even Sunday school, or if you have to teach at all, you'll understand it's very hard work. You can't be lazy to be a teacher. It's impossible. You are, there's a reason they get three months off in the summer. I mean, you need it. Uh, but I, I was there for a year and a half as a math teacher, and was beginning to look to move away once again. Because, you know, I had been having a fruitful time in ministry at another place. Like I said, I had to abbreviate a lot of this because I don't want you to miss Sunday school. Uh, but God was still doing a lot of work. One more, one more weakness. I'm sorry, I have, I'm already over time, so please bear with me. One more big weakness, because this was huge. The church I had been raised in had become a source of hurt for me and a source of bitterness. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, I had went there my entire life. I had did all of the things. I, had, I was excited to do it. And yet, it took me 19 years to see how sinful I was. Understand that. I was buying into the system and yet I still didn't see it. I was doing everything asked of me, and I still didn't see it. So from the moment I was saying, it started, it really started to hurt. Why didn't I see that? And if I didn't see that, how many other people aren't seeing it either? How many other people are going to church their whole lives, but don't really get to experience that grace that I didn't experience until 19 years into the process? And that became pain, and it became bitterness, and I began to see problems in the system itself. And I wanted to change that, and change that, and change that. And I tried to go about it in a respectable way, but a lot of systems don't want to change. Uh, a lot of people like to continue doing what they're doing because that's the way that they've always done it. Tradition's a beautiful thing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with tradition. But tradition that has continued just for the sake of tradition or without being understood, quickly becomes vanity. And I began to see that, and other people were not seeing that. And that hurt. It hurt badly because I could see things in the Word all of a sudden, as a believer who had only been, you know, really studying this and reading it for a few years, and I would try to talk to people about it who had been saved for 30 or 40 years, and they just weren't seeing it, and that killed me inside. Because... By nature, if the grace of God is as good as we say it is, five years down the line from where I start, I'm going to be in a completely different place. Ten years down the line, I'm going to be even further along. Fifteen years down the line, every single year, I'm going to continue to grow in that grace. And I wasn't seeing that in the lives of people who I knew were sincere and I knew were genuine. And for a while, that made me angry. And that hurts. Because I did not know what to do about it. And I actually had a falling out with a pastor up there. Because he had he'd only been there for a few months. But he, he didn't like me very much from the start. And I told him the first time, and I said, I, I'm probably going to be a thorn in your side. Because I didn't know why the fruit wasn't being produced. And I wanted to know. And later he would come at me with, with a few accusations. And that shook me to my very core. Because like I said, I had lived a pretty cushioned life. I had never been accused of anything. Uh, my, I was teaching at the Lutheran school this time, and my boss there would have nothing but kind things to say about me. But this man who I had known for a very short time brought angry, mean accusations against me. And I had to consider them. And I spent that entire day after this meeting I had with him shaken, physically shaken. I was walking around, usually after a confrontational situation, you get some space, you get some clarity, and things.
things started to make more sense. But as the day continued on, things made less sense. And I began to hurt more and more, and I was scared. Because I did not know whether this man was right, or if I was doing what was right. And I prayed about it, and I prayed about it, and God broke me down. And he showed me that, go to this night, you were actually right. The things this man's saying, they were not true about you. Let's take you away from here for a little bit, so you can see. And I began to attend a different church. And that was the first time I had been out of the denomination I had ever been in. I had been in my entire life. And God began to start a healing process and a teaching process of how the system was failing. Guys, it's no, I, I have to be bold with you this morning. It's no, it's no secret that many churches in these United States of America have the same exact issue that I had in my church. That there are many people who are very sincere and genuine about their faith who are just feel like they're missing something. Why aren't we, why aren't we getting it? Why aren't people getting from the pews or the seats out into action? Why aren't men leaving their homes in Christ? Why aren't, why aren't we able to see these things that the Bible talks about? Why don't we see all of the miraculous healings and all that stuff? Is that stuff simply all gone? When I read my Bible, I, I see these things, and they're a reality. They're not just, they're not just fables or stories. So I began to seek that out in a church that was a beautiful experience about, uh, in itself, but it was like a wilderness away from all that I had been raised in. These were people who hadn't been church growing up and got saved in their adult lives and simply took the word of God and said, okay, how do we live this life? And God began to teach me and show me how to truly see the fruit. And that's, if you stay with the second sermon, which hopefully there will be a break between. If you stay, I'm going to talk to you about how a church ultimately bears fruit. Because I believe I've seen it. And I believe that I'm, I'm ready to share that with you guys. And I believe that I'm ready to take the good things you have going on in this church and point them in that right direction. I believe that God has done this work. But the last thing I must say is this past week, God took all of that anger and bitterness and hurt that I had in my heart because it was there and I, could, I, I tried to forgive over and over again. And I'm, I believe you guys have been there too, probably, where you have hurt, and you have anger, and you have bitterness. And you want to forgive because you know that Christ has called us to forgive. But for some reason, something's not clicking in your heart yet. God took all of that, he wrote it down, and he said, you see all that hurt you feel? Change it to compassion. Because I have equipped you now, and you can help them. But I learned one great thing in marriage this past year. I learned a lot of great things in marriage. By the way, Kelsey is a wonderful wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned a lot of things in marriage this past year. But one thing that marriage has done has softened my heart. Because it's easy as a man, it's easy as a human being, but it's very easy as a man when something is wrong to try to fix it yourself. To try to, you know, get angry. Oh, this is wrong. I'm going to make it right. But Kelsey has humbled me. She's taken me. She's, she's allowed me to see things from a completely different light. Because before, which you guys can relate to this, guys, when we see problems, we like to solve problems. Ah, oh, problem, solution, simple. It's over. Got it. Great. And I thought that was the issue in the church. Hey, here's this problem. Here's the solution. It's simple. But marriage has taught me that sometimes simple things aren't simple. I don't mean that as an insult in any ways, but sometimes things that have a very clear solution are still very challenging, right? Sometimes things that look easy on paper are wrenching in real life. And so God taught me compassion over this last year. I worked in a public school system for my first year. This first year in the public school district, it seen kids continue to be in broken homes that I could tell them the word of God. I could preach those things to them. But there was going to be more time required to be invested. And my hands were tied in many ways. You know, I, if you're in the public school system, you know, there are certain things you just can't say. Uh, but I saw some of their own lives and saw that even though the solution to all this is very simple, because the solution is Jesus Christ. Okay, plain and simple. He is the solution. But it takes time for there to be healing for people to get there. 
It takes time for people to truly understand this salvation that was provided for us. And so God broke me down this week and he said, all that anger and hurt and bitterness you have, let it go. And he turned it, he turned it, I didn't turn it, he turned it into compassion. Because that's where it needed to be. Because I can say that this, that, and the other thing is a sinful behavior. Because the Bible very clearly identifies certain things as that. But guess what? I was a sinner worse than them. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. Because Paul, similar to me, but to a much greater degree, he was raised in the faith at the time. He was raised in Judaism. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the Bible frontward, backward, sideways. He knew, it. He knew everything there was to know, and he missed the mark. And it made him compassionate for those who were also struggling. I said last thing a couple times, if I ever lie to you, it'll be bad. <laughs> that was the last part of my testimony. But here's my desire. If you make me the pastor of your church. First Corinthians chapter 2. This has been one of the most impactful passages of scripture that I've ever read in my life. It says, when I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom, for I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit, so that your faith might not be based on men's wisdom, but on God's power. These were the words of Paul. He knew the Bible far greater than anyone in this room does, myself included. And yet, he decided to know nothing among them except for Christ and Him crucified. Because Christ and Him crucified has to be the absolute foundation by which anything else is built. If we don't get that, we don't get any of it. You can know all the stories, but if you do not get Jesus Christ and His crucifixion, you miss the mark. So I desire to make it so that whatever I know about this Bible all ties back into Christ and Him crucified. I also desire this. Jesus said this to His disciples. He said, then a dispute also arose amongst them about who should be considered the greatest. Because mankind has a desire for greatness. But He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles dominate them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you must become like the youngest, and whoever leads like the one serving. I desire to come here not to be just your leader or to dominate you, but I desire to come here to be your servant. I am not coming here to, as someone who knows everything. I will resolve to know nothing but Christ has been crucified, and I will desire to lead you by serving you. If that's what you would have me to do. Let me finish up. I've said that like five times. I mean it. <laughs> the weaknesses I mentioned. God has turned many of my weaknesses over the course of the past ten years into strengths. There was a point in my life a couple of years back that I was able to, you know, I, I mentioned that I was late to some of my own youth services as a youth leader. I was not able to finished college, I failed all those classes. I was able to finish my bachelor's degree with a good GPA and work full-time while I was doing that. And then after that, I went on to get another job. And there was a point that I was actually working three jobs successfully, never showing up late, always on time, always working hard, an example at my work for the other employees. As a second year teacher at the private school, there was another new teacher who told me at the end of the year, she said, Cody, you were the most welcoming to me of any of the teachers at the school. You helped me with so much. I'm not saying that to boast myself because I did not just get smarter, guys. I didn't just figure it out on my own. But Jesus Christ and his cross and his Holy Spirit changed me so that I could do these things. Jesus Christ has brought me to this point that I can stand in front of you unashamed of my weaknesses in my past because I know that I am not bound by them anymore and I know that God has changed them around because we have received salvation and one day we will receive salvation because salvation is in three parts in case you didn't know. We have been saved. 
We will be saved when Jesus returns, but right now we also are being saved. Okay? Uh, the cross has made you flawless. The cross is also making you flawless. God takes you from where you were as a sinner, and he accepts you, and he receives you, and he changes you. He doesn't just say, okay, you're forgiven, now continue in your sin. He says, I, neither do I condemn you, now turn and sin no more. And he teaches you how. He delivers from sin. The grace of God equips you to serve. God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the call. And so I can stand before you unafraid that if you call me to be your pastor, I can't do it on my own. But I know that God has provided a way that I can do that because I've seen that over the past 10 years. I want to say it's been a great privilege, a humbling privilege to just see this church over the past year. I've been, I've been privileged to sit amongst you before you guys knew that I might be your pastor, so you, you, know, you weren't on your guard there. And uh, just to see the love and the care of all the people in this church throughout this wonderful, blissful year of marriage. And uh, I want you to know that if God has called you to any service, whatever it may be, your weakness does not get in the way of God's call. Your frailty does not get in the way of God's call. On the contrary, it qualifies you. Because Paul, he said, I have a thorn in my flesh, and I have prayed to God to remove it. Three times I pray, and he answers the same thing every time. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, dear God, because you are so good. You remain so good to us. You do not make us hide our scars. But Lord, you receive us all the more willingly, and you do your work by your Holy Spirit. Dear God, I'm sorry that I went over on time. I ask that people forgive me on that. And that uh, you bless them throughout their Sunday school classes. Please glorify your name in the midst of